It's being together. It's the sharing around a table, which is how I was brought up. And I'm, I know that that is why I am the food loving person I am, that it was the highlight of my day. That's where I heard the stories. That's where I heard the family stories. It's where I experienced flavors for the first time. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. A few years ago, I was asked to pen an article for an American publication describing Australian cuisine. It was one of the hardest but enthralling deep dives of my journalistic career. The layers of global influence, thanks to migration patterns, the varying climates, produce and marine parks of this vast continent, the evolution of an identity and the embryo acceptance of native ingredients. It's impossible to surmise in 3,000 words, and it's constantly evolving. But there are some people that have left an indelible mark on Australia's culinary landscape and continue to influence our connection with produce and what we eat. Stephanie Alexander is a writer, author, hospitality legend, and founder of Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Foundation. Stephanie, how are you? I'm very well on this lovely day. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, you've uh, played an, a massive role in Australia's culinary landscape and identity. How have you felt this year seeing the damage that's happened to it uh, because of the pandemic? Well, I guess I've been viewing it from the, a distance, having retired and hung up my knives and all of those sorts of things. But I have felt very, very sad for all the people who work so very, very hard to give so much pleasure to all of us. Um, and it has, it has obviously been a devastating year for many businesses and for many individuals as well. Um, but I guess, you know, for me, I can only exude sympathy from afar because I can't really say what it was like. Well, you've uh, you've ran restaurants over many decades, as Stephanie's and Richmond Hill Larder, and you know the slim margins and what it really takes to roll up the sleeves and run a, a successful restaurant. Um, how have you seen the Australian restaurant industry change over the, uh, the last uh, two or three decades? Well, it's probably even longer than that for me. I mean, when I started, um, I was... Um, starting a sort of personal style restaurant, which is now we all take for granted that people do their own thing and have their own way of presenting food or thinking about food. But when I started professionally, that was not the case. What well, the only restaurants that existed were the only notable restaurants that existed followed really uh, definite patterns. They were mostly Italian, not all, but mostly. And you knew what you were going to get before you walked in to some extent. The food was excellent. The service was outstanding, but it was reasonably predictable. Um, and then, of course, came a, a whole clutch of smarty pants like me. who all felt that they, they, not that they knew anything better, but that they wanted to do things their way. And that was sort of all linked with lots of other things in Australia, like the legislation for BYO restaurants. And it meant that people could have a go who didn't have a lot of money, who were not able to access a grand premises, although I ultimately did, but I just certainly started off in a shop front. Um, and that started the change. And of course, as you said in your introduction, we were very, very aware of the impact continuing impact of migration into Australia. You know, just things became available which had not been available before. The food media started really. I mean, it hadn't existed and then it started and sort of every week, every month there was some new outlet or place that people were passing opinions about food and we were, many of us were becoming very interested in what was being going on in Europe um, where the French movement for Nouvelle Cuisine was very important. I'm one of those who think it really was incredibly important and influenced restaurants for many, many years, still does actually. Um, so there was new thinking going on and everybody was having a bit of a shake-up and it just has gone on evolving, getting big, 
then we had, I mean, as you say, the pr profit margins were never great. And um, when I left the industry, what was happening was that things were physically shrinking again. I mean, it was you were putting more and more people into a room in order to maximise the take. Um, it became tricky because uh, more and more people meant more and more noise, meant, um, yeah, it, it has changed out of all recognition. We now have this amazing situation in my city, Melbourne, where you mm. can eat every night of the week a different sort of cultural bent on what you're eating or you can go to a restaurant where they've exploring their own version of fusion, if you like, incorporating what that chef is interested in. Um, and there seems to be no end to the combinations and and uh, different influences that can have, exist in a particular place. And, and, of course, wonderful food is available at all price points, and I think that is one of the distinctive things about this city. Can you take us back to the mid-1970s and how Stephanie's started. It was a restaurant that uh, went for over 20 years. But can you take us back to that time and how you um, started the restaurant and the sort of food you were cooking? Well, I guess my food in those days was very much influenced by France and probably even to this day, my, the, my, the things that I have most emotional, in, that speak to me emotionally, do tend to have their their base in France or in Italy. Um and when I started, I also uh, had, had already had an experience of living in France and of absorbing some of the ways that um, French households ran. I'd lived with a family, been an au pair, taught as an assistant in a French school, so that I really felt I had soaked up a lot of cultural understanding of how the French felt about food. So that when I opened my first very simple restaurant in Brunswick Street, which I might add was an absolute desert, there was Stephanie's a lovely Italian grocer across the road and way up the other end of Brunswick Street was Mietta's. And other than that, the, I think there was a funeral parlour and nothing much else, which is probably very hard for people to believe, but that is the case. Um, so I was serving the sort of food that I really loved and it did have its very strong base in French provincial yeah, more as you could say, um, and and really we were seen, I think, as a bit of upstarts, perhaps. Um, I served a, a prefix, which was unheard of in uh, Melbourne at the time, which was a three course meal, and I think the opening price when we first opened, we had two menus: one three course and one four course, and the prices were nine dollars and twelve dollars. So things. Things have changed <laughs> and uh, I loved that structure and I still, um, when I'm planning to a meal, I've got 12 friends coming for dinner tomorrow night, for example, but I still think the first thing, the middle thing and the final thing. It's just to me it's, there's, a, there's a shape to a meal. It doesn't have, they don't have to be grand and they don't have to be large, but I do like the idea that you move from one thing to another thing rather than just having a great something. Yeah. So that's what we did. We had this choice that people came in. It was a limited choice and I cooked what I wanted to cook. So it was very individual, very personal and very definitely linked to French country cooking. There were some extraordinary chefs that uh, cut their teeth at your restaurant in those days and went on to um, do their own thing. What was it What was it like in the kitchen with... Um, the brigades that then went on to do things uh, and influence Australia's cuisine um, starting from your restaurant? We were all very, it was really amateur hour. I mean, nobody in those early years had done any professional training, and certainly not for the first few years that I don't, I can't remember the first time I employed somebody who had actually done a formal apprenticeship. What, I mean, I employed many, but not in those first couple of years. I really had people who shared my enthusiasm for lovely food, who felt it was about time that food would be cooked very freshly to order. You know, we were very, very up ourselves really. We had fantasy being being a new wave. Well, we weren't new, new wave, but uh, we were honest and we 
were excited. We were excited about what we were doing. And I think that that would have been probably the most distinctive emotion about the, with the people I worked with. They were all excited. We all got equally enthused about a new dish. Um, we didn't have any sort of hierarchical brigade system. Um, you know, it was really very, very unfamiliar to anyone who'd been trained in a proper kitchen. And, of course, it evolved by the time we moved <clears throat> to our grand premises in Hawthorne. I was, it was bigger. Um, we were no longer seating 40 people but seating 100 people. So things had to change. And I certainly had by this stage employed some really wonderfully well-trained people. But I still insisted that the people who worked closely with me were enthusiastic and real foodies. Can you take us um, back to to that period? Do you have any stories of um, some of the times then, and you know where things may have gone wrong, or some some real successes during that period that that you remember fondly? Um, well, I can start off with the negative. The very first night of Stephanie's restaurant, um, we'd obviously been working up to this for some days, and I had a very small deep fryer very little one and at the end of the first night service when I'd probably been working for 18 hours straight I put a plastic bucket under this uh, um, deep fryer to strain the oil plastic bucket got it hot oil and of course it just to my utter horror I watched this bucket expand expand and all this hot oil go all over our perfectly sealed new vinyl floor and I'd have to say it was never the same again. <laughs> it really a nightmare and of course hours then mopping, mopping, mopping and flinging handfuls of salt all over the floor so that we didn't kill ourselves the next day. So that was a, an unfortunate thing that had happened. But I suppose the nice thing that happened was that we did get a lot of accolades and a lot of people who had had European experience, either because they were French themselves or um, just had, their lives had led them to spend a lot of time in that part of the world, they really responded very positively to the food. And so when you serve simple little dishes like rillette, like radishes with butter, all of these things which were just so ordinary in a French little bistro were seen as wildly innovative, which are which was incredibly embarrassing because they weren't innovative at all. They simply were correct. You know, they just were cooked well, presented beautifully in nice little pots, and uh, we chose the butter well. <laughs> so, you know, that's what I mean. It was it was it was a constant buzz to to get really to be to be loved, I guess. We were out there to give pleasure and we got a lot back from the customers too. In uh, 1997, you had really big changes and um, Richmond Hill Cafe and Larder opened. Uh, can you tell us about that venue and uh, how that how that uh, restaurant came about? Well, I think um, I'm trying to think in the scheme of things. We'd been through the re recession in the early 90s and uh, that had certainly taken a chunk out of the uh, clientele of people prepared to spend what by then was quite a high price for, again, still a fixed price menu, and I think it was $75 but um, for the three courses, but that is possibly wrong. I think that's right. And at that stage I thought, you know, there's no scope. And the restaurant was sited in Hawthorne, which, as many people know, was a sort of a residential suburb, which was absolutely fine for a restaurant in the evening, but it certainly wasn't going to get any lunch trade. So I, and I, by this stage, was saying, you know, I'm very confined with this structure. What I want is a much looser place to serve simple lunches. And um, I also had this fantasy I was quite. I was friendly with Will Studd, and he was saying, you know, we need a place where you can have a great cheese room. And I said, and you need a place where you can have a, you can buy really great cookbooks, you know, really unusual cookbooks, and blah blah. Where I had all these fantasies, only some of them came to pass. But the we, I found this premises in Bridge Road, Richmond, which was a beautiful, beautiful space. And we went ahead and opened this terrific 
cafe. And the first chef was Nikki Rima, who had been my been my apprentice at Stephanie's. And then with her came another one of my apprentices, Justin Dowd. And they really, we we will never forget the first day because we I kept saying, it's going to take a while, you know. People have got to find this place and, you know, the cheese room looks a bit forbidding and da, 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 da. And anyway, the first day they had a queue right down Bridge Road and everybody everybody sort of had to sort of smarten up and step into a new gear immediately. It was very, very busy, very successful and good fun. Not everything worked the way I wanted it to work. Uh, the eclectic cookbook collection did not work. It collected a lot of dust <laughs> and people thought that books might be there just to read while you were having lunch, so that didn't work either. But the cheese room was successful. We started a cheese club. We used to have terrific um, little jazz nights once in a while. It was great. It was great. But it um, once again, like all hospitality businesses that I have been involved in, it you know, took vast amounts of work and the returns were very slim. You've written so many influential books, but The Cook's Companion is one that uh, almost, you almost feels like it's in every kitchen in Australia. What, what was it like putting that together and <laughs> what was it like putting that book together? And, and, it was, and it was so long ago as well in such an influential time. Well, it was, it was a amazing thing to do. I'm incredibly proud of it and it required great um, persistence because once started and once I'd realised how much I wanted to say about apples, um, this alphabet stretched forbiddingly ahead of me and, um, I, you know, and I, as my publisher, Julie Gibbs, she would sometimes ring me and to encourage me and I would say I'm stuck I'm stuck in cabbage, you know, sort of thing. And uh, we would have a little chat and I'd get a bit more enthusiasm and keep going. So the whole project, including very meticulous editing, was a four-year project before it actually saw the light of day. And, of course, it drew on my library training, which is very obvious. The uh, you know, I'm very proud of the indexing and the cross-referencing um, which does make the book work very, very well for people. Uh, and I get a constant stream, and it's still to this day I get letters from the general public telling me how much the book means to them. It's now also, of course, available as an app, and we do get feedback, and sometimes people say, I made this and it didn't work, so I immediately rush to the kitchen and cook it again. And um, occasionally they're right but most times they're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's often spoke of that Australian produce is some of the best in the world and your food is really underpinned by quality produce. Can you talk about the connection to produce and what your thoughts are about Australian produce? Well, we do have wonderful produce. I think that, um, you know, I just have the greatest admiration for those people who are out there producing high-quality ingredients I feel that there's a constant need to reiterate to the general public that to buy the best, you're going to have to pay more. Now, people get uh, challenge me on this and I say, well, it, it's all a matter of priorities. And if my, if my priority is to eat well, I want to make sure that when I go and buy um, fruit and vegetables, I want to speak to somebody I want to be able to ha hear a little story about them. You know, have you tried this particular potato? Because, and I will not have tried it probably. And the potato person will say, this one's very good for this, that and the other. I, I love that and I understand. Um, I, I think I understand that that is not everybody's priority. For many people, they will say we haven't got time to fiddle around, just going to nick in here and get what we want and get out and go home. And I have to respect that. But for me, I think that in Australia, the best is available. It does cost a little bit more, but I don't spend any money on junk either. And uh, I know I sound very severe saying that, but it's true. I don't, there's no space in my life for eating rubbish. I just don't like it. And, uh, you know, I can eat 
very simply, I can have a, a wonderful slice of bread with cheese on it and that's lunch. Um, I don't have to have something fancy. But the bread will be the best, the butter will be the best, the cheese will be perfectly chosen because I love it. Not It's not just a slice of something. Well, this ethos that has um, run a thread through your entire career and life led to the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Foundation. Can you tell us about how that started and what impact it's had? Well, I believed and still believe that um, one of the reasons that you know, we have a lot of people who are very quite rightly concerned about obesity levels in our community and um, whilst nobody would claim that there's only one reason for, or one cause for any of those things, that would be foolish. We do live in this extraordinary obesogenic environment where there's you know, uh, fast food or convenience food or whatever you want to call it available on every every time you turn around. And it does seem to me that um, even though there are lots of other things that can be said, what kids, the choices that young people make does influence their health. And therefore, I think Per, mo, parental modelling, positive modelling, it cannot be overemphasised how important it is in your life to get really positive messages, well, not only about food, of course, about lots of things, about behaviour and how you relate to other people and difference and all of those things. And so I think it makes a lot of sense to have an, a program that deals with a broad program that deals with everything to do with food available as a as part of the educational experience we've recently expanded our program to include early learning centers and we have pilot programs in some secondary schools so it's expanding at both ends but it originally started in primary school um, and we had to get a pilot program going and that started at Collingwood College and then we had to deal with the next issue which is still an issue today of funding it and it's been a, well, it's, it's 20 years now, 20, amazing, really. And we have something like um, the, the figures are very rubbery because some, some schools have been doing this at a, a very, very high level for many, many, many years, but many other schools are just starting. So if I say there's something like a 1,000 schools that are involved, um, that's probably not the full picture, and, but many of those schools will be just starting and we are there as an organisation, and of course with coronavirus, it's been a very weird year, but um, we support them. We offer professional development. We have a support team that's constantly, well, pre-COVID, constantly on the ground, moving around, visiting um, or inviting the educators to days where we talk about how best to do this and what you can do if you haven't got any money and how you can still put a garden together and still get your irrigation and how you can call, have a community meeting and how you can ask for help. And, you know, it, this, it is a very, very big project. But what we see when we go to the schools, which, of course, we haven't done for the last eight months, nine months, is unbelievable enthusiasm, for, firstly, first of all, from the students, but also from teachers and also from parents who will flood you, flood me, like put their arms around my neck. Well, they can't anymore, but they used to, and say, um, you've no idea how this has changed the way my son or daughter feels about food. They are interested in what we're doing. They want to open, they want to start a little garden in the backyard. Sometimes they can. Many times they cannot do that. They um, are really, and they try something different. And, of course, one of the things that it's also very rich in teaching about social behaviour because we are very strong on stressing that difference is something to be challenged and excited by, not to be frightened by. So it's it's a very inclusive program. Everybody can be in it. Um, and, of course, it relates very closely to the general curriculum so that teachers need never feel that they're wasting time because they can be talking about fractions or volume or whatever when they're in the kitchen or, you know, it's it's an amazing program. Again, I'm very proud of it. I have pulled back operationally, um, but I'm still, I'm still sort of 
rolled out as sort of the person who can talk about it. And I do love visiting schools and getting a, a real hit of the of the right up close enthusiasm, which gives me the energy to keep on talking about it when I see what how it makes kids feel and what what they learn. You're regarded as one of Australia's greatest food educators. What what does it feel like to have that moniker? And is it something you ever set out to do? Not really. Although I've always been a bit bossy. So, um, <laughs> Uh, I guess I've always been opinionated and articulate and when I believe something strongly I like to tell people so that I, I at university when I was living in a college in a residential college I used to have make long speeches to people if anyone who would listen um, about how the food that was being served to us as students of residential college at the time, I'm sure it's completely different now, was insulting. And I would say, you know, this is not how it should be done. So I always had opinions. I, I think I've toned down a bit as I've got older and I would have, after all, just celebrated my 80th birthday, which I find impossible to understand how that happened, but it did happen. Um so I have calmed down a little bit and I've become much more understanding that not everybody feels uh, as I do um, about the importance of every meal you eat being something absolutely beautiful. I'm not particularly concerned about it being good for me. And, in fact, I risk, I mean, it is good for me. That's This is a subtle difference which I find, which is often misunderstood. I say if any if you're buying food and it's fresh, and you're cooking it with care, it is good for you. There is no point saying, and this is good for you. I, I feel all the hackles and rising when people say to me, I'm making this something or other tonight and it's so good for you. I think, well, for God's sake, it's fresh food. It's good for you. <laughs> you know, your body needs to be sustained. So I, I don't get off on the healthy kick but I believe I eat in a very healthy way if we, if we have to talk about it. The way that we find recipes and consume cookbooks has changed, and you just mentioned how the Cook's Companion is now available as an app as well, but cookbooks are still important uh, to those that love cooking. Has there been cookbooks in the last um, couple of years that have really caught your eye that um, do you think people should get a hold of? Well, I've always loved the stories and I've been very open about that so that cookbooks that really um, go straight to my heart are the books that are telling me the stories of why this person has included this particular recipe or where they were or who spoke to them. And in that category I'd probably put my friend Emiko Davies who lives in Florence um, who's written three books now um, on Italian food her most recent one is called Tortellini at Midnight, um, and she's particularly interested in gathering traditional information and the it seems to be endless, the stories that she manages to find from people um, who have lived in a certain way, have the tradition associated with a particular dish. Now, I know that a lot of people don't, don't get um, turned on by this, but for me the stories are at least as important as the recipe. But, you know, I've read an awful lot of cookery books by now. Um, and, of course, Elizabeth David, who is certainly not the last couple of years, has always been my my touchstone. You mentioned that you're cooking for a large group of friends uh, in the coming days. So what's going to be on the Christmas table this year for you? Well, the Christmas table, I'm going to be cooking duck for my phone family. Um uh, but tomorrow night is my closest friends and we, who all then separate off into their own families for Christmas. So we've traditionally had a meal together and most of us, um, w my kitchen, whilst it's adequate, very good really, but it's it struggled to cook for 12 these days. So we're, everybody, it, it is a combined thing, but I'm very dictatorial about people what people are allowed to bring. And they expect that. They like that. They like to be told that, you know, this is what I'm bringing, this is what you're bringing. And it means that it is something where I can look forward to it with pleasure 
rather than saying I'm going to have to cook for two days to um, to do this. So I don't have to do that. I'm, my part of it is uh, an ocean trap and, um, you know, I'll just do something beautiful and I'm doing a very big tray of slow braised vegetables in olive oil and bay leaves and garlic and that will be pe- reared in yellow peppers and chunks of fennel and chunks of whitlof and probably lots of rosemary from the garden, but cooked for a long time at slow temperature so it really almost melts and it'll all be served sort of probably room temperature, I think we'd say. What What is it about cooking and food that you love? It's being together. It's the sharing around a table, which is how I was brought up, and I'm, I know that that is why I am the food-loving person I am, that it was the highlight of my day. Uh, I, it's where I heard the stories. It's where I heard the family stories. It's where I experienced flavours for the first time. It's where I listened in to the last to the four, the older generation. My grandfather lived with us for twenty years, and it's where I learnt to help my mother and would roll bread rolls while she was making them, or watch her pickling chickens' feet and various odd. She had a she was very curious, um, but that modelling. I've got two brothers and one sister, and we're all in our own ways, really keen on the family table. You know, that's our way of being with others around a table with lovely food that you've spent time making as well as you can and usually growing some of the food, although I don't grow anything excepting herbs now, but my siblings, they have more extensive vegetable gardens than I have. You celebrated your 80th birthday this year and your influence on our culinary landscape is immeasurable. Um, what are your hopes for the new year? Well, well, I think we're all going to be quite happy to say farewell to 2020. Um, what do I hope for? I want. I hope that to visit a lot more of our lovely schools and spread enthusiasm and soak up their enthusiasm, That's that's an important one. I'm hoping that we will find a way of convincing government, either state or federal or both even, to fund us more effectively uh, or fund us really. i just leave that off because they currently are not. And um, for myself, I want to stay well. I want to see maximise the time I can spend with my family and hopefully do a little bit of local travel. I think I have set aside the idea of travelling overseas for the moment. My 80th birthday was planned and booked in the south of France. Well, there we are. That didn't happen. But, you know, there's so many wonderful places and things to do in this country that um, I will never run out of places to go. Well, Stephanie, it's an absolute honour to have you on Deep in the Weeds and for me personally to speak to someone that's been so influential on my own cooking. Um, Please keep in touch and have a great Christmas and we'll talk again soon. You too. Thank you so much, Anthony. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.